let y'all wake up. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Oh, there we go. I'm in the right church now. All right, so good to see all of you. We're not going to stand just yet uh, because we still are, are being served. Um, want to make sure that everyone has a handout. Uh, when you came in tonight, you should have gotten a handout for tonight's uh, message and lesson. Um, if you don't, um, in just a moment, once First Impressions finish serving, they will be able to give you a handout. So just raise your hand and they'll make sure that you get one. Um, and then also, uh, for those that are visiting with us tonight, so glad to have you for our first, second, third time guest of visitors. Um, tonight is uh, a little bit different than Sundays. Sunday is the night where we dig in a little bit deeper to the Word of God, and we invite everyone to bring a physical Bible with them on Wednesday nights. Uh, gives you a chance to kind of flip through the, the, the pages of your Bible. Amen? And uh, see what God is saying in the Word. You'll be able to make notations in your Bible and that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, uh, tonight we want to make space for questions questions um, as we dig into this lesson tonight. Uh, so we, we've been announcing uh, the last maybe two, three weeks um, that we were going to do this series uh, titled Rethink Your Life and uh, literally finished lesson number one and last night was getting ready to finish doing some other administrative things that we have to do for the messages to get ready for Wednesdays and Sundays and just kind of really felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit to not do that lesson. So, of course, uh, for those that don't know what that means, as a minister and a preacher, when you start preparing a lesson and you finish it, and then the Holy Spirit comes after you've done it. So it's almost like uh, uh, any of y'all ever cooked a meal and the meal is done, and then some people tell you, I don't want to eat that, let's go eat somewhere else. Yeah, that's what you felt. Yeah, that's what I felt last night, too. So nonetheless, I uh, was up late last night trying to hear what the Lord wants to say. So we're going to start another series. It's called Managing Your Emotions Under Pressure. Managing Your Emotions Under Pressure. So with that said, let's look at James chapter number one um, is where we're going to be. James chapter number one. Uh, Pastor Tommy stepped out, but we're so glad to have him back safely uh, from vacation. Amen. Thank God for him and Pastor Lucy and the girls. So James chapter, number is, is, James chapter number one is going to be our focus scripture uh, actually for this entire series, for this entire, entire series. And let me quickly tell you guys where we're going to go over the next five weeks. So um, if you'll go ahead and put that next slide up there for me, please. Uh, here's where we're going to go tonight. We're going to talk about uh, what does it mean to be, be good and angry. What does it mean to be good and angry? And we're going to focus in on what we do and how we handle our anger. Next week, we'll jump into what does it mean to be saved and restless? Anybody here restless or have been restless before? Raise your hands. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want to be here next week. Uh, week three, we're going to talk about uncertainty. When you're not sure of your next move and the emotions that come with that. Week four, we're going to talk about revenge, what that looks like. And then lesson number five, week five, we're going to talk about being excited about the right things. Being excited about the right things. All right, James chapter number one, verses 19 and 20 is going to be our focus scripture for this entire series. And I believe this verse is going to be so powerful for you, powerful for all of us, uh, powerful for you in this series. Um, we have cards that we have printed out that has this scripture on it. We want everyone to take one. We want you to, over the next five weeks, memorize this verse. Memorize this verse. Take this card, memorize it. If you have the YouVersion Bible app, bookmark it in your Bible. Highlight it in your Bible. So they're going to, First Impressions is getting ready to pass these cards out right now. Uh, we want to let them pass them out, and then we're going to all read it together. All right? Um, as you're getting your notes ready, we are also going to be, there's going to be two Psalms that we're going to read tonight as well. Um, Psalm 73, Psalm 73, and Psalm 10. Psalm 73 and Psalm 10. So those of you that are worshiping with us online tonight, so glad to have you tuned in and worshiping with us. We pray that God will uh, inspire you, motivate you, encourage you, and light your fire of faith tonight as well as we jump into God's Word. All right. Everybody, everybody has it? All right, in James chapter number one, I believe we have it also for the screens, and I want us to read this together once we get it up there. James chapter number one, verses 19 and 20. All right, if you got it, say, I got it. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. On the count of three, let's read together. One, two, three. My dear brothers and sisters, 
Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Stop. It's a command. Verse 19 is a command. Verse 19 is a command. Verse 20 tells us why. Verse 20 tells us why. Verse 19 is a command. Verse 20 tells us why. Let's start to begin at the beginning and read the command, and then we're going to keep reading it to verse 20 to read why. One, two, three, go. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Mm. Let's go. Emotions are powerful. Emotions are powerful. We cannot see, taste, or touch them, but we are constantly affected by their forceful presence and incredible influence that they have oftentimes over us. God created you and I with the capacity to experience the full gamut of emotions so that we could enjoy life so that we can enjoy life, share our true selves with others, and watch this, write this down, ultimately reflect his image. Ultimately reflect his image. God gave us our emotions so that we could enjoy life, share our true selves with others, and ultimately reflect his image. What do you mean when you say reflect his image? God himself is emotional. It is a necessity for God to reveal himself to human beings. The very pervasive concept of God as male is an anthropomorphism because God is spirit. God takes the most meaningful aspects of human life and uses them to reveal himself to our fallen humanity. Though necessary at times, i.e. Genesis 3 and 8, God does not want to be limited to any physical form. So when you say God is emotional, Pastor Chris, what are you saying? John 3, 16, God loves. Psalm 11 and 5, God hates. Genesis 19, 16, God has compassion. Genesis 6 and 6, God grieves. Nehemiah 8 and 10, God experiences joy. Isaiah 62 and 5, God rejoices. Jesus himself understands this. Hebrews chapter number 4, verse 15. Genesis, excuse me, Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Please hear that. So Jesus understands because he himself has dealt with every emotion that we ourselves have dealt with. The difference is he did not sin. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We see in Mark chapter number 3, Jesus was visibly angry, Mark 3. Matthew 23, Jesus was verbally angry. In Mark 11, Jesus was physically angry. So, our emotions, please, please hear this. Please hear this. This is a major point that I want you to get tonight. Our emotions are designed as a gift from God. They're a gift from God. There are times and places and circumstances that bring out emotions to the surface. Now, even though our emotions are a gift from God, our emotions are a mixed blessing. What do you mean by that? The same capacity that allows us to experience intense, overflowing joy is also the gateway to sorrow so deep and so overwhelming that like Job, there are times that we may wish we had never been born. That's Job 3 and 3. 
So, emotions, they're going to put this on the screen just in case my twang messes you up. Our emotions come from, the word emotions comes from the Latin term emover. Emover, which means moving. Now, the term emotions is actually a combination of this idea of energy and motion, which is an expression of how life is constantly in motion and our emotions are constantly in motion. Okay? Emotions are something that we constantly feel and can happen when actions or feelings stir a certain response from us. We may feel emotions from a situation, from an experience, or, watch this, from memories. We can have real emotions from our memories. They assist us to understand the things that we are experiencing and to express the way that those things make us feel, whether they are good or bad. Please hear this. Sometimes, in the case of trauma, emotions can get stuck or blocked off so that when we experience them again, we cannot process or react properly to them. Positive emotions are meant to reinforce an experience as enjoyable so that we can seek that experience out again. They activate the reward systems within our brain, which makes us feel safe and okay. Negative emotions, on the other hand, warn us of potential dangerous situations and raises our survival instincts so that we become much more aware of what's going on around us. In a way, our emotions have evolved to help us survive in a more thinking society than our ancestors, but the reactions are very much the same. Now, that's all foundational. Why did I tell you all that? To get you to this point. Go ahead and put that image on the screen. All of us have eight core emotions, eight primary core emotions. We are born with these emotions. That is, we are wired with these in our brain. Okay? <clears throat> and I may use a few different words here than some of the ones that are in that circle, but they're, they're the same idea. Anger, which deals with f fury and outrage, irritability, hostility, resentment, violence. Number two, we have sadness, which is grief. Sorrow, gloom, melancholy, despair, loneliness, and depression. I mean, this is, this is so random. But let me ask a question. This is so random. Y'all know me. Y'all, I'm going to be all right. D do y'all go back and look at those pictures in your phone when y'all take them? How, how many of y'all forget the pictures in there? I'm just curious. Okay, I'm just, I just wonder. Because y'all take a lot of pictures. I love that. Love that y'all take the pictures. I just wondered if to get lost. All right, back to my notes. Number three. Number three. Yeah, I dealt, dealt with sadness, right? Yeah. Number three, fear. Fear. Fear is about anxiety. Please hear that. Anxiety. Anxiety. Apprehension. Nervousness. Dread. Fright. And even panic. That's all under the umbrella of fear. Number four, it's joy. That deals with excitement, enjoyment, happiness. Watch this. Relief. Bliss, delight, pride, healthy pride, thrill, and even ecstasy. Number five is about interest. Interest. This is about acceptance, friendliness, trust, kindness, affection, love, and devotion. Number six, we have surprise, which is about shock, astonishment, amazement, being astounded, and even wonder. Number seven is disgust. Disgust, that is about contempt, disdain, scorn, aversion, distaste, and revulsion. And then finally, you have shame. Shame, which is about guilt, embarrassment, remorse, regret, and even contri contrition. Now, those are our eight primary. Somebody say primary. Eight primary emotions. Now, according to many in the psychology space, 
In the United States, there are upwards of 48 recognized emotions. And watch this, internationally, there are up to 128 recognized emotions. Now, if we have eight primary emotions, where do those other emotions come into place? Look at this next image. <laughs> These, these other emotions are known as secondary emotions. Secondary emotions. So we have eight primary emotions, and then we have a slew of secondary emotions. The primary emotions you are born with. The secondary emotions are learned behaviors. Are learned behaviors. The secondary emotions are much more complex because watch this, please get this, they often refer to the feelings that you have about the primary emotion. So you have the primary emotion, whether it's joy or fear or surprise. The secondary emotion is an offshoot of that that is a response to the primary emotion. So you are mad at yourself for even getting angry. Okay? You are worried because you're fearful, okay? A part of why we would even go through this and talk through this is so that we can begin, somebody say, dig deeper. Oh, that wasn't enough for y'all. Somebody say, dig deeper. dig deeper. Dig deeper to not just what we do, but why we do it. Why did we respond that way? What was the trigger or what are the triggers? Okay, write this word down, intentional, intentional. I believe that if you have been praying over the last three to six months and inviting God to drive your life, to take your life to another level, if you've been praying and anticipating God doing new things in your life, at some point in the last three to six months, you have wor heard the word intentional. That word intentional speaks to this notion of getting off, off of autopilot and being intentional or deliberate about not just what you do, but why you do it, why you think it, and why it even matters. Secondary emotions are learned emotions. Sometimes we get this from people. We get this from our environment. We get this growing up. Sometimes we get it from watching certain channels or shows on a regular basis. When you feel angry, you may feel ashamed afterwards. Or when you feel joy, you may feel relief or pride. I love this in Star Wars. Any Star Wars fans in here? Any Star Wars fans? All right. Master Yoda explained the secondary emotions perfectly. He said, fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. Secondary emotions, okay? Secondary emotions. Now, let's dig into this a little bit more. Let's dig into this a little more. I'm going to skip over that for now. Jesus' brother, his half-brother, his name is James, wanted to address God's people who were going through tremendous pressure and tremendous difficulty. They were dispersed abroad and separated. They believed in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, his half-brother, and as a result, many of them had lost everything that they had here on earth, their homes, their employment, their safety and security. In many cases, they were separated from family, and on a whole nother level, they were persecuted because of their faith. It is on the backdrop in the context of this that James writes in chapter 1, verse 19, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Then, as I mentioned earlier, he gives us the why. Why? For the anger of man does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. 
In other words, he says, I want to move, I want you to move beyond just seeing what's coming at you and responding to actually being a channel by which God's promises and power can be released to other people. Did y'all catch that? You are called to be a channel by which God's power is released to other people. Let me say it again. You and I are called to be a channel, a pipe, a viaduct, a roadway, a bridge by which God's power is released to other people. What are you saying, Pastor Christopher? Um, when God wants to bless us as people, he often uses people to do it. He often uses his people to do it. But when our people don't manage emotions well, we restrict God's power flowing freely through us to be able to get to other people to be a blessing. Touch your neighbor and say, he's going somewhere with this. Let's talk about pressure. Let's talk about pressure. Just out of curiosity, if you want to be transparent tonight, how many of y'all feel like you're in a season of being under pressure? Okay, let's talk about it. If we could be honest tonight and not be so sanctimonious in church, we're all prone to blow a fuse or feel like we want to burn the house down. This verse, verse 19 and 20, was written to people under pressure. Some people are prone under pressure to react however they feel freely to react. Financial pressure, relational pressure, job pressure, emotional pressure, physical pressure. Sometimes it's screaming kids. You could have just done the floor, or cleaned the house, and now the dog comes in from outside, messes up the floor you just, just mopped. It could have been that you just did the laundry. And now all of a sudden, everybody wants to bring their old laundry that they didn't tell you needed to be washed and restock the laundry room. It could have been that you gave your best shot on a project at work. You turn it in after many long hours of working on it, only for your boss to respond back minutes later saying that this is not sufficient. What is your response? In many ways, we get angry. Some people just blow up. Others, it's like they just have a short in their wiring. And when there's a short in your wiring, you can't even tell anything's wrong because you're always just reacting to the situations and circumstances that happen. You got to dinner one night, you come back, and it's like your house is in ashes because that's what anger does. I want to show you this video really fast that shows you the effects of what happens when we get angry and then when we try to apologize after we've had an anger tirade. Watch this video.
What did you just see? You said that door will never be the same. The nails being pulled out were the apologies. The door will never be the same. Love that. What else did y'all see? Yes, sir. Regret. Regret. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Damage. Okay. Anybody else? Hmm? Brokenness. Okay. Please write this down. We judge ourselves by our intent. We judge other people by their actions. Well, I didn't mean, but that's not what I, that's our intent, right? But when other people hurt us, we don't judge them by their intent. If they didn't mean to hurt us, if they didn't mean to offend us, we don't really give them a pass. And a part of what I want you to hear tonight, and I want you to understand tonight is this. Just saying that you're Christian is not enough when it comes to managing your emotions under pressure. Because you can be a Christian and still create damage. Please hear that. So part of the key to managing our emotions under pressure is to evaluate. Somebody say evaluate. Evaluate the pressure. Evaluate the pressure. Write these down. Eliminate the hurry. The hurry. They're going to put it on the screen. Eliminate the hurry. Eliminate the hurry. Number two, downsize your expectations. And I'm going to go through each one of these. Downsize your expectations. Number three, learn to say no. Number four, admit mistakes and imperfections. Admit mistakes and imperfections. Number five, laugh more often. Number six, take care of yourself. And number seven, know your triggers. Now let's break, break these down really fast. Number one is what? Eliminate the hurry. Please hear this. Sometimes speed and godliness are incompatible. Sometimes speed and godliness are incompatible. Here's the deal. Some of us just move too fast. We move too fast, we speak too fast, we think too fast, we react too fast, we respond too fast, we make judgments too fast, the whole nine yards. Speed and peace are often incompatible. You want peace, but you're still moving at the same pace. It's impossible sometimes. Watch this, hurry and loving others is often incompatible. You want to love people deeply. You want relationships deeply, but you want to rush. Right? True, healthy, valuable relationships take time. They take time. I was talking to somebody the other week. They just moved to Tampa about maybe three months ago. And their, their frustration was, I don't have nobody that I can relate to. I said, you just got your water turned on. You ain't, been here, you ain't been here long enough. You don't even know all the sections of the city yet. You, you barely have had time to unpack all your boxes. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? We, we, want, we want deep relationships quick. That doesn't happen quickly. That doesn't happen quickly. It is unhealthy and it is unwise for you to get into a connection with somebody and all of a sudden start saying, that's my best friend. No, that's what kids do. That's what kids do. And you're setting yourself up for failure because now you've created, watch this, an idealistic expectation on this person that is not fair to them. 
Can I talk to my singles for a moment tonight? Don't go to the first date saying that's the one. Don't do it. You don't know them well enough. You're having dinner with their imposter. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Let me talk to my couples for a moment. Let me talk to my couples for a moment. Don't, don't get in such a hurry in life that you're not able to be fully present with the person you're with. Touch your neighbor and say, slow down. Please hear this. Hearing God's voice and being in a hurry is incompatible. If God is in charge, there will be times in your life where you will sit down and pray and you will not be released to get up and move. If it hasn't happened to you yet, you're not praying right. If, you, if you've been a Christian for a year, two years, three years, five years, and God has never interrupted your time and, put, and, you, and, him, and him put you on his schedule, you're not praying correctly. That means you're doing all the talking, you're not doing any listening. Because when you stop and listen, sometimes he'll tell you, stop moving. Be still. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God, which is almost to suggest that you can only know God in his fullness when you sit down and be still. Number two, y'all quiet tonight. That's okay. That's okay. Number two, downsize your expectations. Now, man, Pastor Christopher, now you sounded like, a, sounded, sounded like a hypocrite because you always tell us to operate with high expectations. Please listen to this. Most of us try to do too much too soon, and we feel overwhelmed, and it puts us under pressure. Because our expectations are so high, and we're under pressure, our emotions just bubble out. Maybe, maybe downsize your expectations may not have been the best way to say that. But I want you to understand that sometimes you and I hold ourselves to a standard that is unrealistic. You can't do everything all the time. You can't be accessible and available to everybody all the time. You can't go out with your friends and have a sane life and do well on your job and manage your money and work out and sleep all the time. Somebody say balance. Which leads to number three, learn to say no. Now, please hear this. Please hear this. Learning to say no does not mean you have to be rude or calloused or condescending or spiteful. But it does mean that you respect yourself enough and your relationship with God enough to be kindful or kind, artful, and excellent and intentional in how you live your life. Somebody say plan. You should have a plan for your life. Under this banner of saying no, learning to say no, you should have a plan for your life. You should have a budget. A budget is a plan for your money. So that tells you what to say no to sometimes. You can't, you can't go out to dinner with everybody sometimes when you're on a budget. Some weeks is a no week. <laughs> Some weeks is an eat at home week. Okay? You can't always go to the movies every single week just because the movie come out. Please hear this. You can't get the new phone just because it's cute and the article or the ad looks good every time the new phone comes out. Oh, y'all going to look at me like that, huh? For all of my sneakerheads in here. Sometimes you have to wait a period of time. Just because the shoe came out doesn't mean you have to get it right then. Ladies, learning to say no sometimes means that you will have to go without getting your nails and feet done and just use regular lotion.
Fellas, sometimes learning to say no means that you will not be the life of the party and may in fact have to cancel your NFL or NBA subscription so that you can't host that week or that season in order to get your life together. Learning to say no. I told you I was coming for you tonight. Come on. Number four, admit mistakes and imperfections. Please hear this. This is a question that I want you to reflect on. Do you realize how much pressure and stress you put under yourself when you feel like you have to slightly bend the truth in order to make yourself look better? Guess what? You're not perfect. We're not perfect. And it is perfectly human and okay to say, I messed up. I, I feel like at least I should have got like five amens just then. <laughs> it's okay to say I messed up. It's okay. It's okay. And please hear this. If you're around people that don't want to hear that, those are the wrong people. Okay? Amen. Number five. Number five. Proverbs 17, 22. Proverbs 17, 22. The Bible says that laughter is like a medicine. Laughter is like medicine. Laugh more often. Laugh at yourself. Laugh at yourself. Intentionally smile. Now, this is going to be nitty-gritty for some of y'all. Some of y'all will need to write this down. Some of y'all need to set an alarm on your phone to remind you to smile that day. Because some of y'all's resting face is not pleasant. Some of y'all's resting face makes the devil scared to say good morning to you. <laughs> and we're laughing, but I'm very serious. Because as a follower of Christ, our goal is to be inviting to those that we come across. And when you wear pressure on your face, everybody sees it. So some of y'all need to set a reminder on your phone. Smile today. Smile today. Number six, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. We've been saying to you all as a church for the last several years, we want you to eat better. We want you to work out. You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to go and, and, and throw everything on the wall every single time you work out, but try 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day. Can I, can I even tell you something? If, if some of y'all, when you get off from work at 5 or 5.30, and you want to go grab your snack or maybe pack your snack at home before you leave in the morning, come to the church and walk around the church, the parking lot. Walk around the gym, 6 o'clock. Come in, 30 minutes. Ain't nobody, you can sit, you know, a little distance in church that night. So if you feel like you don't want to intimidate nobody, if you sweat, you know, whatever you got to do to get it in, somebody say, get it in. Get it in. Take care of yourself. Now think about it this way, and I wrote this down like this. Our bodies are high-octane machines. There are some machines, some cars, you can't put unleaded in it. Because when you put unleaded in it, it's going to destroy the car. Some cars only allow premium fuel. Basically, the way that we've been eating and taking care of ourselves as Americans, we've been using unleaded in premium fuel vehicles. Take care of yourself. Here's number seven. Know what triggers, know what triggers your anger and your emotions. So write this down. H-A-L-T. H-A-L-T. Halt. For many of us, many of our triggers are going to fall into one of these four categories. Some of y'all may be a little bit different, and that's okay, but I'm going to give you something to think about. Halt. H is for hungry. <laughs> How many of y'all hungry now? Uh-huh. Can't even hear from God because you're hungry. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. H, the A is for angry. The A is for angry. We're good, Adrian. Thank you. The L is for lonely. And the T is for tired. 
when you are hungry or angry or lonely or tired, you may need to take a step back before you just react to stuff that's coming at you. You may need to take a step back, take a deep breath, and get yourself together before you just react to the stuff that's coming at you. Okay? When a person is wounded, when there's an unmet, unmet need, when someone ticks us off, when someone cuts us off in traffic, when we don't have enough money, when God doesn't come through the way we think he should come through, when our expectations aren't fulfilled, our emotions begin to bottle up, we get angry, and we express it in very, very different ways. The great majority of people don't even know that they're angry. They don't even know that they're angry. They have some secondary emotion, but they haven't dug deep enough, nor have they slowed down enough to evaluate the reality that, in fact, they're angry. There's a lady who's a psychologist that wrote a couple books for InterVarsity Press, and uh, she has a private counseling practice for the last 20 years that she's been involved with. She lists common reasons why all of us at times feel angry. Let's, let's, um, let's just zoom in through a few of those. And I'm going to say this, uh, some of them will make you laugh. It is okay for you to laugh, okay? These are just some normal things. She writes, someone cut you off in line. Someone misunderstood what you said. Someone ignored your feelings. You had a breakup in a relationship. You feel trapped, smothered, and controlled. You feel like a failure. Someone broke your trust. You were abused by someone. Someone lied to you. You had to wait in a very long checkout line in the store. Your kids are not obeying you. The waitress is very slow and brought the wrong food. You stubbed your toe. You find it's too late that you're out of toilet paper. <laughs> the line to the public restroom is very, very long. Your spouse forgot to call you and they were late. The clothes you wanted to wear are still at the laundry or in the hamper, and they're not clean. Your spouse has been unfaithful. You ran out of time and weren't able to get things done that you needed to. You drove all the way across town to find that the store was actually closed. The kids continuously and relentlessly demand your time. You forgot to do something that, were, that was very important that you were supposed to do. Here's a big one. You don't have time for yourself. Someone says something harsh or insensitive to you. A person in a store was very rude to you. You were in a hurry and you hit all red lights. Your boss doesn't appreciate you. Someone undid the work you just did. The driver in front of you is very, very slow. Someone close to you passed away. Now, all of these things at some point has happened to almost every single one of us in this room. What we want to do is understand anger then from God's perspective. How do we tend to express our anger? When is it healthy and when is it unhealthy to be angry? God has a purpose for anger, but he has some very specific techniques for it. So let me give you a working definition. You knew that was coming. Let me give you a working definition of anger. A strong feeling of displeasure. A strong feeling of displeasure. A strong feeling of displeasure. Now, this is going to be new information for some of you. Anger is neither good nor bad. Anger itself is neither good nor bad. It is morally neutral. Why is it morally neutral and neither good nor bad? Because anger is an emotional response to protective preservation. We are trying to preserve ourselves or protect ourselves in some way. So our natural response is to be angry. Okay? Now, watch this. Y'all have heard me say that our emotions are indicator lights of the dashboard. Here's what you may not know. Anger can be considered a secondary emotion. Anger is not the problem because it's a warning light. 
If you and I were to be honest with ourselves and brave enough to peel back the anger, we can actually discover its true motivating force. When people abandon us, let us down, when someone doesn't come through, when we feel rejected, left out, lonely, sad, or sorrowful, we usually cover it up with anger because these emotions are so strong, painful, and confusing that it serves as a release valve for us. Please hear this. Anger artificially helps us to feel in control. Anger artificially helps us to feel in control. When a person is responding in anger, oftentimes they have actually lost control and feel helpless and powerless. Anger is like a horse. A horse can be wild and dangerous, or a horse can be a great source of joy. So how do we make anger work for us? Let's talk about good anger for a moment. Let me give you a good couple examples of how anger can be very, very positive, how it can be healthy, how it can motivate us toward correct attitudes and behaviors and injustices that we perceive to be wrong. More than anything else, when we see that the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, 32, watch what he says here, Ephesians 4, 32, in your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. The rest of the verse says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give place to the devil. So, this says to us, that there is a place for good anger. Here's what you want to write down. We ought to become angry at the things that anger God. We ought to become angry at the things that anger God. Now, here's where I need y'all's help to save time for a moment. I need one person to grab Proverbs 19 and 19. If you got that verse, just say, I got it. Say it loud so I can, thank you. I need another person to grab Proverbs 22 and 24. Proverbs 22 and 24. Thank you. I need somebody else to get Proverbs 29 and 22. Thank you. So, so for those that are taking notes, we, we're going to look at Proverbs 19, 19. We're going to look at Proverbs 22, 24. And we're going to look at Proverbs 22. 9 and 22. If unchecked, talking about bad anger now, we talked about good anger just now, talking about bad anger. If unchecked, it can have an amazingly negative consequence and pitfall in our lives. It can be an unhealthy and destructional, destructive emotional response to protect us from real or perceived hurt, frustration, or even personal attacks. Listen to what the wisest man to ever live, Solomon, has to say about the issue of anger. Who's got Proverbs 19, 19? All right, stand up and read really, really loud for me, please. I'm going to bring you, bring you the mic. And tell us what translation you're reading from as well, please. ESV. ESV. A man of great wrath will pay the penalty, for if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again. Proverbs 19, 19. This translation says, a hot-tempered man must pay the penalty. If you rescue him, you will have to do it again. When people learn to deal with their anger in unhealthy ways, here's what this verse says, it becomes a pattern. It becomes a pattern. Who's got Proverbs 22 and 24? All right, stand up and read it for me. He's coming with the mic. Thank you. Tell us what translation. NIV. NIV, thank you. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Not only does it become a pattern in their life, but you catch it too. It becomes contagious. We, we, we apply this to our children, but we don't apply it as adults. We say to our children often, birds of a feather flock together. Okay? But as adults, we don't often practice that ourselves. Who's got Proverbs 29, 22? 
Brother Frank, hold on for just one second. He's bringing the mic. What translation are you reading from? New Living Translation, NLT. An angry person starts fights. A hot-tempered person commits all kinds of sin. See, start, do it, read it again, please. I want to make sure they heard you. An angry person starts fights. Hmm. A hot-tempered person commits all kinds of sin. Wow. So first thing I want you to know is this. Notice is this. Every fight is preventable. Every fight is preventable. Anger splits apart great relationships, great marriages, great friendships, great churches, great ministries, great workplaces. Angry people stir up dissension. Now, what is dissension? What is dissension? Division? What else? Mess. Drama. Huh? Evilness. Yeah. Yeah. I want to use the term drama that makes no sense, right? Just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. And notice the last line of the verse that he read. Please hear this. A hot-tempered person commits many sins, plural. When a person gets angry, they get out of control. When they get out of control, they're not thinking straightly. And they will push everyone until... Life or circumstances stops them. They end up doing foolish things. So, there are three big reasons why we get angry. Three big reasons why we get angry. Here they are. Number one, as a result of unmet needs. We get angry as a result of unmet needs. We can call that hurt. Because that's what it feels like. It just feels like hurt. We needed somebody to love us or we needed somebody to comfort us when we were grieving or we needed a connection where we were lonely. We needed somebody to talk to us or talk back to us or just whatever the case may be. But it was an unmet need. That need did not get met. And so then we get angry. Number two, unmet expectations. We can call this one frustration. Well, we expected a person to respond a certain way. Expected a person to do this. Expected a person to treat us based on how we treated them. Expected a person to sacrifice based on our sacrifices. Expected a person to understand. Expected a person to do this or to do that. A lot of our anger is built into expectations, and oftentimes we are surprised when people actually respond the way that they respond. Here's the big deal about this one, though. People can't read our minds. Oftentimes you have to get your expectations out of your head and actually into the relationship with the person that you're with. Here's the third reason, third cause, that often we get angry. This is a major one. Insecurity. Insecurity. When we're personally attacked or threatened. And this is real or even perceived. Because sometimes we can perceive that someone is attacking us when in fact they're not. And often our anger is merely an evidence of insecurity in our lives. Hmm. The big idea here is basically your own perception about your own worth. Your own perception about your own worth. Now, we're at the tail end of the message tonight. I want to give you a few masks that we put on when it comes to anger. A few masks. There could be more, but I'm just going to give you three. The three masks that we put on are spewers, stuffers, and leakers. Spewers, stuffers, and leakers. Here's who spewers are. A summary of all the research about people who spew their anger. There's two types of spewers. 
exploding time bombs, totally out of control, totally out of control. They almost have to be physically restrained. The other spewer are calculating time bombs. They know when they're going to do it. They think they know why they're going to do it. But big enough, they know how they're going to do it. This is called premeditated anger. Okay? The message that they carry in their life is that anger is necessary, that I'll only be respected when people see my anger. You bet I'm mad. Do what else I say or do what I say or else. For spewers, this is often a power issue. Again, for spewers expressing their anger, it gives them a false sense of power and control. It helps them release pent-up negative emotions. They feel unable to constrain or control their anger. These folks have no self-control. They yell, they scream, they shout, they push, they shove, they hit, they kick, they intimidate, they are aggressive, they become overly opinionated, overly blunt, forceful, tactless, demanding, and repetitive. This group of people, when they get real mad, they tend to repeat, repeat, repeat the same words and phrases over and over and over again. The, the real result then is they wound themselves and others. Their false sense of power actually causes, it, causes them to create great damage to the extent that this group of people often feels the greatest levels of guilt after their episodes. They have amazing remorse after their episodes. In many ways, spewers maintain strained relationships because most people keep them at a distance. They never know when they're going to blow up. They never know when they're going to lose their control. They never know when they're going to have violent behavior. What a spewer needs is to develop a longer fuse. They need to learn to control their anger. Unconsciously, spewers have to give themselves permission to stop and breathe. Often they will say things like, I can't help it, or I'm Irish, or I'm Hispanic, that's how we are, we're hotheads, or I have red hair, or that's just the way that I am, or my parents did it and it worked for them. Or, the worst of all, they will say a phrase like, you made me angry. Please hear this. No one can ever make you angry. No one can ever make you angry. People can do wrong things to you, but you have a choice about how you respond. Hmm. Y'all real quiet. Here's the second one. Stuffers. Stuffers. There are two types of stuffers as well. There are those who repress, repress, R-E-P-R-E-S-S. -S. That is, they tend to deny and avoid. They tend to deny and avoid. The second group of stuffers is suppressors. So you have your repressors, repressors and then you have su your suppressors, S-U-P-P-R-E-S-S. -S. They pretend and stuff. They pretend and stuff. The message that stuffers believe is that anger is bad. Their reaction to, are you angry, is angry? Not me. <laughs> they are afraid of their own anger. They think it's bad or even sinful to even get angry. They fear God's wrath because they got angry. They fear a loss of control or making a fool of themselves if they get angry. They fear rejection by others if they get angry. Those people will reject me and I'll feel like an outcast. They don't like to feel guilty. And when they get angry, they absolutely feel guilty because they are mad that they're even angry at whatever they're angry about. They've experienced angers, anger sometimes in their past that was so scary that they try to avoid it altogether. They fear retaliation, they fear punishment, or the consequences and outcomes of expressing their anger, even if they express it the right way. 
most of this they learned as a child. So how do they stuff it? By ignoring it, denying it, shielding it, or deflecting it. Sometimes they can even minimize it, pretending that they're not really angry by simply trying to bury it. Paul Meyer says 95% of all depression is anger turned inward. Wow. Think of that. People that are very, very depressed now have clinical reasons that is tied to their anger. They push it down. They don't address it. And watch this, y'all. Please hear this. Stuffed anger can literally cause ulcers, headaches, and other physical reactions in your physical body. Here's the result. Almost done. Stuffers become doormats. They're taken advantage of. They redirect their anger at themselves. And then the result is that they develop physical ailments that they don't even talk about. Occasionally they may erupt, but they do it alone by themselves, which is kind of weird. Okay? They never share it. This group is really dangerous because, please hear this, they will smile on the outside but develop a heart of resentment on the inside. What stuffers need to do is accept, accept that anger is okay and normal, to acknowledge their fears, and seek to minimize their hold on others, learn to communicate anger effectively, become more assertive when necessary, and know that it's okay to have real needs and real want, and to become clear about they, what they will and will not do. Here's the last group, leakers, leakers. The technical word for this group is passive aggressive. <laughs> a leaker is a person who is angry, but what they do is they have, as you'll look, the same fears as stuffers. They have the same belief system as stuffers, but they can't just keep stuffing it all the time. So what they do is, I'm angry about this situation, about this person, about this hurt, about this injustice, this pain, this wound, but I'm not going to deal with it over here. I take the anger out somewhere over there and take it out on that person or that thing. The result then, please hear this, Christians, is sarcasm, negativity, Procrastination, being very rigid and frigid, being overly critical, and watch this, consistent lateness, no follow through. <laughs> there are indirect and direct leakers. Here is their message. In their minds, it is not the anger that is bad, it is showing anger that bad, that's bad because it will show a weakness. How do they leak it? They leak it by not following through on their commitments or promises, by not letting their yes be yes and their no be no. When a person is really a leaker, I'll do this, goes to well I wish I could, which goes to I can't. The result is, a false or an unhealthy sense of power because in their mind, if I say yes to the person and have the person expecting that I'm going to do this and then I let them down, then in fact, I've got the power because I'm getting back at them. That is twisted manipulation. Many times they aggravate those closest to them and also create strained and weakened relationships. They become isolated. They withdraw. They avoid dealing with the real issues. So what a leaker needs to do is accept that anger is okay and normal and to acknowledge their fears and seek to minimize the influence of those fears over their life. Please hear this. Leakers need to learn to communicate effectively. 
So, what is the answer then? What is the call to action as we close out tonight? Verse 19 gives us the answer. Go ahead and put the verse back up there for me, please. Here's the step. Here's what he says. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to get angry. Let me give you all these final points, A, B, C, Ds. Acknowledge your anger. Acknowledge it. Sometimes you need to say that to yourself. I'm mad. Number two, the B, backtrack to your primary emotion. Backtrack to your primary emotion. When you hear and see why you're mad, go back to those eight core emotions and see what is really connected to this. C, consider the cause. What caused me to be angry? Is it a person that offended me? Was there an unmet expectation that I had? Was it an unmet need that I had? And then finally, D, determine how you're going to deal with it. Write in parentheses, the right response. The right response. Please hear this. For Christians that have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us, we can no longer be unhealthy in our emotions and use God as the excuse. Did y'all catch that? As Christians that have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us, we can no longer be irresponsible for our emotions and use God as the excuse. Well, God's still working on me. He is. But you still can have some self-control. He is. But you still can control your anger. He is. But you can still slow down and learn to say no to certain things. Somebody say amen to that. Here's the final quote. Dr. Becca Johnson writes, when we find ourselves in an unwanted situation with angry feelings, we basically have two choices. Do I express my feelings to the person or do I release them indirectly through various other activities? Dealing with it directly means choosing to confront the situation in a healthy way, which oft often will create positive change. Not addressing it automatically makes the choice that there will be consequences and casualties from the choice that we just made. I pray that you've been blessed and challenged to deal with your anger in the right way. What questions can I answer? Yes. You're an emotional stuffer. Okay? Okay? So I'm going to read again what I said earlier. Okay? What stuffers need is to accept that anger is okay and normal. Number two, they need to acknowledge their fears. Learn, number three, to communicate that anger effectively. Number four, become more assertive with their needs. And number five, become clear about what they will and will not do. Does that answer your question? Amen. Yes, sir. What's that? The mask, the three masks. So the thought process is, is that 
that is often our mask that we put on when we get angry. So, the blessing is, is if that doesn't apply to you, you could be sitting here tonight saying, God, thank you that I've grown in that area, that I haven't picked up those unhealthy traits, right? Because here's what we don't acknowledge. Many of us don't acknowledge that we did not all have good examples growing up of how to deal with conflict, right? And just because you become a Christian doesn't mean you automatically pick that up. You have to learn how to deal with conflict in the right way. You have to learn it. And please hear this. Our, our theme this year is what? Freedom. Freedom. Many times, not every time, but many times the bondage that we're experience, experiencing is a learned bondage that we created. Okay? Any other questions? Take one more. All right. Yes. Habits of the leakers. They are passive aggressive. So everything on the passive aggressive that you can think about is a leaker. Yes, sir. Okay, I just promise you this last one. You get in. That's a good question. Um, based on what I've read, I think you can be at times just passive without being passive aggressive. Yes. Just passive, yeah. Yeah, so I think even though I think we have to be careful because I think when we say we don't care, we actually do care and are afraid to deal with it. Yeah, I don't care. No, we do care. Because guess what? If you didn't care, there wouldn't be a strong emotion attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's stand together. Pastor Tom, are you going to close us out, sir? Oh, he doesn't have a mic. Let me read this to you all as he comes. Um, this, was a, this was a quote that I heard today that ties right in with what we're saying. If you don't deal with your demons, they go into the cellar of your soul and lift weights. All right, let's pray. <laughs> Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for emotions. You've made us to be emotional beings. We're made in your likeness and your image. And uh, anger is, is an emotion that we have that you've given to us. Uh, anger can be used in a positive way. Many times anger can spark change. And we can get angry about social injustice and things that are happening in our life. We can get angry at even things that we're doing that we know we shouldn't be doing. But many times anger can be used in the wrong way and it crosses the line and it can turn into sin. And so God, may all of us look at that emotion of anger because we all can feel it. Even tonight as we get ready to leave this, this place of worship together on the way home, somebody could cut us off. <laughs> somebody could call us. Somebody could send us a text. Right in just a simple, quick moment, our emotion can change, and anger can, it can get stirred up. Tomorrow, it could get stirred up at our job. Somebody can make a, a rude comment. There's all kinds of things, God, that can trigger our emotions of anger. So, God, help us to get a handle on it. Help us to represent you, and when people look at us, they'll be able to see that we live differently. We respond differently. We react differently. Uh, even when it comes to this emotion of anger. Help us to be healthy. Help us to be balanced. Uh, help us to go and grow and apply the things that we learned tonight from your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Everyone said. Amen. Amen. Well, bless you guys. See you guys on Sunday. And hey, by the way, if you guys like break dancing, this Saturday night there is a break dancing event that's happening here at the church. Um, it's going to be this Saturday night from 7 to like 10. So if you want to come out and see some B-boys and B-girls, it's going to be amazing. God bless you guys.
Never said I'm a saint, never said I was perfect. All my life doing right is worth it. My time in the pen, yeah, I deserved it. Purpose found Jesus, yeah, you heard the it. You ain't here with it, but now you know. Still in the club doing major shows. Don't get to judging me, I hating though. This time bringing light to gangster bros. I give thanks to those who never gave up on me. Some of my friends turned their back up on me. Said Jesus done changed the homie. Want me to go. Drink down, put the dang down. Get your mind right. Get your, get your, get your, get your, get your mind right. Get your, 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 get your,